open our chair chairperson dr shrikant khade to kindly come and chair the session i think dr rajesh raju is still yet to come the i uh, dr elfin viera along with dr amit don as my convener and chairperson dr shrikant khade and rajesh raju uh, will start the second session i call upon dr mukesh doshi he will be presenting a 20 year follow up of earthquake victims a longitudinal study is it audible good morning everyone so we all aware that we have a big earthquake on january 2001 and that left with us mountain of debris dead body and cries we plan a long term rehabilitation program because most of the time what we have realized the surgeon has come they do the surgery but there is nothing was written on the paper or follow up or a rehabilitation management and we have seen a children less than 1 year who has lost both the legs to plan for their rehabilitations we have to start the temporary rehabilitation center in rural area then we started a follow up and still today we are treating all earthquake victim free of cost on that area whether it is coming from ahmedabad or any other places so 10 years follow ups we had given him a lot of paraplegics we had given him a wheelchairs and 20 years follow ups recently you have completed with a enjoyment and happiness now what is a good stories about everything you see the first day of the patients with the paraplegics and they teach us a lot of new things with the new ideas especially for a uti infections people try with lot of medicine but local medicine what they teach us and how we get the uti control very fast that was amazing we started rehabilitation program with orthotics physical therapy and everything the first slide you can see how we have made a total spinal contact brace along with the bracing physical therapy then we put it into a vocational training program she fall in a love with a boy they married and they get a baby boy now it is another story of another girl rajgor in 2001 you can see a small baby we made a processes for him and we just gave him a child walker after giving the walker she coming with us uh, today also or regularly and you can see the second photograph third photograph and now she is pursuing with the phd in chemical engineering now it is a very interesting story about this lady she has lost his one hand and the people says if you cannot do the bilateral activity husband says i will leave you and it was a great challenge for us to rehabilitate her so we made artificial hands immediately getting supply from bombay and we fit the artificial limbs she can do all bilateral activity like combing the hair making chapatis writing and everything and entire family is survive and they can connect it together and they live its happy life today this is another girl chetna who has lost his both the legs daughter husband and a home and such kind of a patients when we rehabilitated to him with so many technology but we are a failure and she lives only a wheelchair life now this is the again very success story of a woman power she met with the trauma accident aboni amputee today she can dance she can do garba everything she is doing a tailoring job she is moving from one place to another place she has make a female empowerment of more than 5000 female who is become a tailoring masters and she has given employment to the lot of people in the rural area though she is a aboni earthquake victim so and she has received a lot of medals 
This is my all VIP patients who also injured during the earthquake, but we treat them very well. So, my home taking message is very simple. It is easy to do the surgery, but plan for the rehabilitations. And really the challenge is lying down in the rehabilitation of any human beings. Thank you very much. We welcome Dr. Rajesh Raju as the chairperson for the session. Can I welcome Dr. Aditya? Is he here? My study is a prospective randomized control trial comparing the clinical, radiological and functional outcomes between the suprapetalar and infrapetalar nail insertion techniques in the Indian population. As we know that the TBL intramedullary nailing was traditionally done by the infrapetalar approach where the knee is in 90 degrees of flexion. In this position, the pull of the quadriceps tendon tends to pull the <coughs> proximal fragment anteriorly, which results in a procurvatum deformity, especially in the fractures of the proximal one third of the TBL shaft. Also in this position, the fluoroscopic assessment of the reduction of the fracture fragments is a challenge. Also infrapetalar approach is known to be associated with risk of damage to the infrapetalar nerve that may result in post-operative anterior knee pain. To solve these problems, the suprapetalar approach was introduced which is done with the knee near extension or about 10 to 15 degrees flexion. Here the deforming forces of the extension mechanism get neutralized, so the risk of procurvatum deformity is less and also the fluoroscopic visualization of the frag uh, fracture fragments is easier. However, the suprapetalar approach is associated with risk of damage to the patellofemoral articulation which has to be studied to know uh, the efficacy of this approach. This is the consort flow diagram showing the study methodology. All the <coughs> patients uh, with extra articular TBL fractures who presented to our level one trauma center were uh, screened based on the predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria and after taking informed consent they were then allocated into either the suprapetalar or the infrapetalar nail insertion groups. A total of 60 patients were recruited with 30 patients in each of the two groups who were then followed up for a period of 6 months following which uh, at the end of 6 months the MRI of the knee joint and diagnostic knee arthroscopy were also done. The objectives were to compare the clinical, functional and radiological outcomes between the two methods of TBR nailing and also to compare the intraoperative radiation exposure, the total blood loss and the operative time. The clinical outcomes assessed were the post-operative knee pain, especially the anterior knee pain and the knee range of motion. The functional outcomes were assessed using three scores, the knee society severity score, the petalofemoral subscale of the knee injury and osteoarthritis outcome score and the lysome knee scale. The radiological outcomes were to assess pres presence of any malreduction especially if there was any virus or procurvatum deformity, uh, radiologically assess the fracture union and also to look for any evidence of petalofemoral joint damage. This is the distribution of the duration of surgery of all the patients. Uh, here the operative time we found was significantly lower in the suprapetalar group as compared to the infrapetalar group. Also the blood loss, again the average blood loss we found was significantly lower in the suprapetalar <coughs> nearing group with a p-value of 0 0.02. The radiation exposure was assessed both based on the number of fluoroscopy shots that were taken during the surgery as well as the average radiation exposure noted from the CM at the end of each case. Uh, here we did not find any difference between the two groups with respect to the radiation exposure. Clinically, the anterior knee pain as reported by the patients according to the visual analog score at 2 weeks, 6 weeks, 3 months and 6 months of follow up. Uh, there was no clinical significant difference uh, between the two groups with respect to incidence of anterior knee pain as well as the knee range of motion which was comparable in both the groups. Uh, this table shows the functional outcomes which all three scores were calculated at 6 weeks, 3 months and 6 months of follow up post operatively. 
you can see that the mean values of all the three scores at all the three time points of follow up was higher in the suprapetalar nailing group however on statistical analysis there was no difference between these two groups there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups with regard to <coughs> the rate of fracture union as well as presence of any malalignment in the sagittal and coronal planes MRI knee was done for 57 out of the 60 patients of which 13 patients from the suprapetalar group and 13 patients from the infrapetalar group showed some evidence of chondromalacia which was graded according to the modified outer bridge classification. There was no clinical significant difference in the incidence of chondromalacia seen between these two approaches. Knee arthroscopy was also done. It was done for 16 of the patients due to limitations posed by the COVID pandemic. We could not do it for all the patients. Uh, in, out of 16 of these patients, 11 had some evidence of chondromalacia of which 9 were of, of the suprapetalar group and only 2 of them were from the infrapetalar group. Uh, the chondromalacia was primarily seen over the medial and lateral patellar articular facets and the trochlear groove. This difference we found was statistically significant. Comparing the arthroscopic and MRI grading, we found that there was moderate correlation between the two with correlation coefficient of 0.44. However, the MRI tended to miss uh, grade 1 chondromalacia which was better picked up by the arthroscopy. There was one case where there was false positive chondromalacia which was seen on MRI. However, on diagnostic arthroscopy, the uh, articular cartilage was found to be normal. To conclude, the suprapetalar nailing of TBL shaft fractures may help to reduce the intraoperative time and the blood loss as compared to intra, uh, infrapetalar nailing with similar clinical, functional and radiological outcomes. However, there remains a risk of damage to the patellofemoral articular cartilage as evidenced by the arthroscopic findings and we need longer term follow up with a larger sample size to better uh, assess the risk of patellofemoral arthritis following suprapetalar nailing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditya, for a very comparative uh, study between the suprapatellar and the infrapatellar nailing. But uh, I think the uh, conclusion till now, I think infrapatellar is more better than the suprapatellar, right? Sir, uh, in our study, sir, uh, suprapatellar nailing, we got very good results. Even the uh, operative time was lesser. Uh, initially, sir, there may be a learning curve. Uh, with respect to suprapetalar nailing. However, sir, uh, after a few cases, it was equally uh, technically easy as well as with comparable results as compared to the infrapetalar group. Yeah. But uh, it is very difficult to convince the patients post-operative arthroscopic diagnostics. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir, initially we had uh, explained the patients and a lot of them, they wanted to uh, have the diagnostic arthroscopy for their Peace of mind. Yeah. So Very good. Did you use tourniquet? No, sir. No, for no nailing, no, we no did not. Did you do an arthroscopy pre op or No, only sir, we did not do or pre op. How do you compare then? Sir, basically, we have included only young patients less than 45 years of age who ha had no history of any previous knee pain or arthritis. That is a limitation of the study. But uh, because of the uh, issues regard uh, with respect to uh, preoperative arthroscopy, uh, we have only done postoperative arthroscopy, taking the assumption that since the patients were young and they did not have any symptoms, so most likely they may not have any uh, pre-existing uh, articular cartilage injury. Anyone from the chair? Any queries? No. Thank you, Aditya. I call upon the chairpersons to present him his certificate. <coughs> now I call upon Dr. Drusha to present his uh, functional outcome of simultaneous ACL reconstruction and HTO for patient with medial compartment osteoarthritis. Good morning one and all. Um, I'd like to thank Wyrock Max for this opportunity. I'm here to present a study on functional outcome of one stage ACL reconstruction and HTO in medial compartment osteoarthritis. <laughs> So as you know, knee instability in ACL deficient knees could be due to traumatic injuries or chronic wear. This deficiency can progress to medial compartment osteoarthritis. 
five times the higher risk of osteoarthritis in acl insufficient knees is documented adding fuel to this fire is a varus faster progression of the medial compartment oa there is an adduction moment force leading to a varus thrust this varus thrust exerts additional strain on the acl graft which predisposes us to early graft failure traumatic acl injuries are common in 20 to 30 year old age group who progress to radiologically significant osteoarthritis at the early age of 30 to 50 years a valgus hto is a widely used treatment for medial compartment oa in the young and early stages it reduces the uh, adduction moment arm and thus pre prevents uh, force on the medial compartment of the knee what we aim to address is a simultaneous acl reconstruction with the hto should decompress the medial compartment correct the axis decrease the strain on the reconstructed graft by decreasing the varus thrust forces and however the simultaneous surgery can prolong rehabilitation and theoretically increase the tibial slope straining the graft so o'neil and james in 1992 first described this uh, this procedure and one as a one stage procedure so materials and methods of patients with medial compartment oa or tibia vara with acl insufficiency a scoring of an icd ikdc score lyshom score range of movement and latchment test were used we had a sample size of 22 patients the mean follow up was of 2 years mean age group of 40.2 years longest follow up was a 4 year 7 month patient and score was the ikdc lyshom latchman and knee rom so people the patients who were included were acl insufficiency with varus age between 25 and 60 kelgen rollins grade of 1 and 2 a revision acl with a secondary medial compartment oa patients excluded were the ones with lateral compartment osteoarthritis age above 60 multi ligamentous injury and patient not not consenting so this is one case which we had patient had a left sided traumatic acl tear 4 months prior he had an anteriorly instable knee a tibia vara angle of 6.4 degrees and a high predisposition to progression of the varus due to right side already having a 11.3 degree varus This was the case of an ACL with HTO done for this same patient. These are some more cases which we have done for the same ACL with a concurrent HTO in a single stage. The results were a significant improvement in the scoring. The IKDC score improved from 34.48 to 86.20. Lyshom score went down from 37 points to 89 points. The mechanical femoral tibial angle was corrected from an average of 8.2 degrees of varus to 0.8 degrees of valgus. <coughs> significant improvement in the laxity evaluated by the same clinician evaluating the latchman test pre surgery these are the scores which we had mechanical axis change which was not significant uh, which is significant ikdc score and lyshom score so combined acl and hto has the obvious advantage of undergoing a single procedure with a faster recovery the need for it is decreasing the stress on the acl graft due to decreasing the varus adduction forces delaying the progression of medial compartment oa and Uh, delaying the need for conversion to arthroplasty and providing a stable knee joint with the correct corrected axis to younger individuals who wish to continue sports activities the changes in the operative steps for a single stage would be use of a table which can be broken and straightened intraop for the for the acl and then for the following hto part preparing the graft in the femoral tunnel before the hto to prevent any hyperflexion of the osteotomized knee the plate should be placed on the posterior medial aspect to decrease the tibial slope and provide space on the anterior medial tibia for drilling of the tibial tunnel the plate should be fixed with posterior screws first followed by tibial tunnel drilling and the anterior screws inserted after drilling of the tibial tunnel with there's an insertion of a metal dilator during drilling of the anterior plate screws to prevent interference of the tunnel and the screws 3 out of 22 patients had a positive latchman test after surgery but had an improved functional outcome 2 out of 22 patients had radiologically significant progression of the medial compartment osteoarthritis there was no significant change in the tibial slope pre and post operatively and no patients in the study period we had who reported any graft failure so at our center we were able to reproduce satisfactory results in patients and thus can conclude that one stage acl reconstruction and hto is a suitable option with acl insufficiency and medial compartment osteoarthritis however very little has been described in the literature and larger studies should be able to validate as well as find any other shortcomings of the above described procedure these were the references and thank you for your attention yeah one uh, one question mr dhru where the medial meniscus status was considered 
Yes, sir. So when we underwent the diagnostic scopy and during the MRI, we had two patients who had a middle meniscus tear and both of them were repaired in TROP. But because of the not able, we were not able to correlate that with the progression of middle compartment osteoarthritis. Hence, we've excluded that part of the study. But a larger study would be able to help us with that. Yeah. If at all, the, the medial meniscus is considered for repair, were there any, uh, like you can say, uh, protocol in physiotherapy change no the physiotherapy change for anyway was which we halted for 3 weeks because of the for the healing of the hto and then we progressed with general 3 week post 3 week rehabilitation for the acl with the meniscus that's it anyone from the audience no doubts great thank you dr dhruv can you please collect the certificate Thank you. I welcome the next presenter, Dr. Aditya Kashikar. Good morning, everyone. So this kind of MRI picture you uh, come across in your clinical practice where patient has come uh, with severe stenosis at cervical, dorsal and lumbar level. So as a clinician, you are confused. Triple tandem, oh my god, how should I address it? Which investigation, neurologist involvement? So many questions come to your mind. Whether should I do multi-stage or single-stage study? So all this confusion uh, comes to your mind. So in next five minutes, I'll be brushing upon how to manage these kind of patients where we come across triple tandem stenosis patients. So as a clinician, uh, what is the causative region, which investigations to be done, as there are no clear-cut guidelines in literature, so every, uh, means uh, we are confused how to go about it. So we did a retrospective review of prospectively collected data of consecutive patients who were diagnosed to have triple tandem uh, stenosis. Same st uh, team of surgeons did this surgery at single stage uh, procedure and between August, uh, from August 2009 to Feb 2020. There were uh, 12 male patients and five female patients. Patients' functional outcome was assessed at six monthly interval with VAS and MODI. Clinical presentation wise, these were the commonest symptoms which, with which patients presented to us. So inclusion criteria was patients listed in earlier slide uh, were all included with exclusion criteria of unfit patients declared by medical team or uh, uh, any neurological cause contributing to the uh, etiology. All patients uh, were investigated by, uh, by X-ray, CT scan, MRI and neurophysiological studies. Neuric grading wise preoperative, this was the grading, uh, where grade four was the, uh, the max patients with which we uh, came across. All 17 patients underwent same stage uh, triple region decompression surgery by same team of surgeons. The training surgical steps and pre, uh, pre and post surgical protocols were same at all hospitals where we did this surgery. Uh, we, in last five years, we started using ultrasonic bone scalpel. This is one of the cases where we did long segment uh, laminectomy, where you can see intact lamina taken uh, en masse. So one may question that why we did only laminectomy, why fixation was not contemplated in such a large uh, laminectomy cases. So we believe that these cases are all autofused, stable cases. Most of them are having OLF or DISH. And uh, how one will decide how many levels to fuse because those were extensive uh, involvement of the uh, compression. And basically, we are treating these patients for their neurolog neurological symptoms and not for actual pain. 
post operatively all patients were uh, subjected to vigorous physiotherapy rehabilitation both during their hospital stay and post discharge imaging was done at 4 months 12 months so uh, vas wise this was the uh, improvement in vas scoring pre and post both arm neck uh, and back and leg wise MODI improved from preoperative average uh, mean of 74.42 to 20.25. We uh, came across uh, dural tear in seven patients, uh, out of which six were in dorsal region, one was in lumbar. Neuro deficit was found in five patients post surgery, and uh, neuric grading wise deterioration in neurology was depicted in this chart. Uh, out of these five patients where neuro deficit was seen two patients recovered and uh, three did not improve neurologically and out of that one patient we had to uh, do revision decompression two years later so this is one of the cases where there is triple tandem uh, stenosis and this was a post op pretty mri showing very good decompression second case with multi level cervical dorsal and lumbar level uh, stenosis with post operative very good decompression follow up mri so in literature uh, there are no large series uh, showing any single stage uh, triple regional stenosis decompression surgeries so most of them are case reports where multi stage surgeries was done our is the largest series up till now unlike western population uh, max population is divided of uh, enough government aided or private medical insurance support in our uh, in in our region of uh, world so financial burden wise also it's quite huge if we consider uh, uh, three stage versus two stage and uh, uh, as a mentality indians avoid multi surgeries multiple surgeries and financial aspect also we feel that single stage surgeries one can Uh, reduce the cost by almost 33 to 50 percent, and loss of working days also we can save on. So take home messages: single stage decompression surgery uh, for proven cases of triple regional uh, stenosis is an effective surgical way of treatment with reasonable good outcome. Uh, there has to be high level of suspicion. One should rule out all non-spine causes before taking them up for surgery. Don't hesitate to asking a uh, list of investigations. newer modalities like ultra ultrasonic bone scalpel can be used safely and good uh, vigorous physiotherapy is must post surgery thank you any questions <coughs> sir frankly speaking neurophysiological studies are just to document on paper uh, they don't decide your level of surgeries this is just to uh, decide whether there is involvement uh, of so basically that is not going to decide your level of surgery sir it just to document whether there is any neuropathy component or any muscle involvement or uh, uh, basically posterior column uh, function in accps so just to prognosticate point of view because post surgery if patient is developing any neuro, neuro deficit priorly already patients have been counseled about the neuro deficit part so at least you have evidence that neurophysiologically also they were compromised pre surgery so that helps us in post surgical uh, counseling also not necessary because we have seen that to start with only their meps are low even if you do neuro monitoring with such kind of severe stenosis to start with so baseline is only to start with its low so it's not like where normal patient is there where meps are normal and later on during surgery there is a decrease in meps so there is no baseline with which we you can compare recently we did one surgery where intraoperatively when we turned the patient before operating the meps uh, correct the correct so there was the patient and then we took the patient's consent and then went to extremity <laughs> Good morning chairpersons on the dais members of the faculty and my colleagues 
Soft tissue sarcomas are rare neoplasms, and they're often treated with a multidisciplinary approach using radiation and wide local excision. While there are many advantages to limb salvage surgery, post-operative morbidity in these patients with soft tissue sarcoma may result in a functional decline, decrease in quality of life, and increase in the number of operations with wound complications which may occur in as high as 45% of the patients. A multimodality therapy for this disease yields excellent control in the local uh, tumor, and the survival has significantly improved. However, the risk factors, even though they have been identified, because of the variation in the reported factors, there is no, no particular contributing factor for wound complications. So they may be patient-related, tumor-related, or treatment-related factors that can contribute to the final wound outcomes in these patients. So there has been a strong attempt in the sarcoma community to create a nomogram which will recognize these patients better who are expected to have a wound complication post-operatively. So a single high-volume center uh, under the University of Toronto and Mount Sinai Hospital identified more than 3,000 patients with soft tissue sarcomas and we validated the existing nomogram. So with the external validation of the nomogram, the the rate at which we were able to predict these wound complications in patients was an acceptable 70%, which is not, not excellent, but just acceptable. So we therefore asked the questions, what are the additional risk factors associated with wound complications in these patients? And can we improve the predictive nomogram to assess the risk of wound complications in individual patients after resection of soft tissue sarcomas? Maybe it's not a triangle, but a square of factors that are affecting the wound outcomes in these patients. So do the surgical factors affect outcomes as well? In the 3,000 patients we, uh, that underwent soft tissue sarcoma surgery, we identified and subclassified the surgical factors that were analyzed. So details on the anatomical site, extent of resection, method of reconstruction, as well as the type of closure at index surgery were analyzed. And as expected, even though the nomogram only used an upper limb versus lower limb classification, on our subclassification, we found that the groin and the axilla was significantly more prone to wound complications postoperatively. When coming to resections, tumors that needed to be resected along with vessels were significantly at a higher risk of wound complications in the final post-operative course. Addition of reconstruction, everybody requires reconstruction to resume function and mobility. So addition of reconstruction, whether it's a vascular procedure or adding a metallic prosthesis, significantly improved the complication rates. And lastly, the technique for closing the wound played a significant role in the final outcomes. So a multivariate analysis of the surgical factors significantly played a role in determining the outcomes of these patients. And the next step would be to improve the predictive nomogram and create a new updated nomogram to include the surgical factors as well. Thank you. Any questions? So, so if there is a large defect without any muscle in the base of the defect, we need to bring in healthy muscle, which will act as a absorption uh, base. If there is not, then we do a rotation flap, free flap. Also, all patients which uh, undergo extensive vascular dissection, the lymphatics have been removed with the tumor, so they need a drain they, for a long period of time, and the drain has to be kept till it is significantly low, even if it is beyond two weeks continuously significantly low till it is removed. So the body has started developing the absorption channels mm -hmm. and only after which the drain can be removed. So these large defects, can it be better treated with this way and a rotation flap primarily or putting a vacuum dressing which is the, you know... So vacuum trend. dressing will need to be skin grafted uh, after a healthy granulation is uh, achieved. But the defect may be so large that even a skin graft may not completely heal. So 
closure with healthy skin and muscle is always advisable because most of these patients either preoperatively or postoperatively will require radiation therapy. So skin graft is not the best solution. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manit, for thank a you. very good presentation. I thank uh, all the presenters on behalf of uh, YROC team for their presentations and uh, wishing all the best for uh, future presentations also. Thank you.